I need some traction. Hey, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining today's session. I am very excited to be your host and thank you Traction for asking me uh, to host uh, Jeff Titterton, CMO at Den Zendesk. Uh, it gave me an opportunity to meet someone who I'd never met before. So this has been really fun. Uh, I'm Julie Persofsky. I'm one of the uh, managing directors and practice leads of customer success at Winnie by Design. We're a, a go-to-market consulting firm specializing in B2B SaaS, but really um, anyone with recurring revenue models. Um, I'm so excited to introduce you all to Jeff Titterton today. Um, we're going to learn a lot from him. He's uh, a marketer who actually understands the world of customer experience, which we, we coin CX. So we hear a lot of companies, it's a big theme, right? Um, okay, we need to do CX. So how do we do it? Okay, we're just going to say we need to do CX and then hope that it happens. But Jeff's here to give us some really fundamentals of, you know, how to actually do it. So we're really excited. Jeff comes from a background of startups. He was with 99designs. I'm pretty sure everyone here today has used 99designs at some point in their life. Um, so he's too, so even though his last two companies, Adobe and Zendesk are, you know, a lot bigger, more corporate, let's not judge him. He's well-rounded. He's come with a lot of great experience. Um, and he also has some, some interesting insights going from B2C to now B2B. So welcome Jeff. We can't wait to hear from you. Great. Thank you, Julie. And I, I like to think of Zendesk as a, as a grown up startup because we were a tiny little startup 13 years ago. So just... I used you when you were a tiny little startup. So <laughs> yes. And I used us when I was at startups. So I, I, I remember the, the explosion of Zendesk back then. So yeah, great. Perfect. Uh, so how we're, what we're going to do today is, you know, I just want to ask you a couple questions. So, you know, in a nutshell, Jeff, uh, you know, what do you think are some of the common mis misunderstandings that companies have around CX? I, I think one kind of common misunderstanding is they tend to think of CX as, oh, customer service, right? And, and I really think that that's not really true. I, I think that for the end consumer or the end, end buyer or whoever, it really is, they're thinking of I'm interacting with a brand, right? And so it doesn't matter if they're talking to sales, they're talking to marketing, they're talking to product, they're talking to customer service. They are just annoyed at you if you're not doing a good job, your company. And so companies need to think much more holistically than they tend to. I tend, I think sometimes they go, oh, CX, let's hire a service leader and then they're going to solve all those problems it's it's a much bigger problem than that yeah i absolutely hear that so why don't we get started i know you, you've prepared some things and it'll definitely spark some conversations uh anyone i'll be manning the the chat uh or womaning the chat uh today and so if you have any questions uh i'll i'll be sure to to see them and to jump in jeff do you want to do you want to give it a go and, and share your screen and, and get started i'm sure you're going to give us lots of things to think about and to inquire about yes so i am going to yeah let me just pull this up and i always have to do that can you see my screen julie can you confirm um, yes, we can. Excellent. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm going to give about a 25 minute presentation here on CX strategies to fuel growth in the new normal. Um, and I'm going to talk about both what Zendesk has been doing during this time to make it more real. I'm also going to talk about what we've learned from our 160,000 customers. For those who don't know Zendesk, I hope you all do, but for those who don't, we've been around for 13 years, as I mentioned, we serve companies of all sizes. We serve tiny startups and SMBs all the way up to Fortune, you know, Fortune 100 companies. Um, we are very focused on CX. We offer our product, Zendesk is primarily a CX product. We also offer sales products, but I'm gonna talk from that CX lens here today. Um, so, we're really going to talk about today is this new normal. I'm going to talk about what things have happened during the pandemic. I'm not going to bore you to tears. I think we've all been living it and experiencing it together. Um, the good, the bad, the ugly, but um, want to talk about some of the shifts that we've seen and what they've meant for us as we move into this new normal. So there are big shifts in CX happening because of the pandemic that we think are going to continue as we come out of it, which we hope eventually will come out of it. Um, so couple of those big trends that we've seen that really affect how companies have to be thinking about CX. First is this work from home culture is really here to stay, we believe. Tech companies have led on this. Companies like Zendesk are either going back partially remote, full-time remote, really depends on the companies. We've all read about this, but this is just really changing 
companies across the spectrum have realized in many industries that their employees can be more productive working remotely. Uh, this means that CX has to shift because the way that we communicate with people um, has to shift because they're working in very different situations. The second bigger shift is that digital communication is here to stay. This was here before the pandemic. This is a trend that is only accelerating with the pandemic. Obviously in our daily lives, we've seen a shift away from even things like phones, offline communication, et cetera, and more and more towards digital communication. If you talk to the average 20 year old, they are obviously, they're not even talking on the phone. They are living in social media. They're living in text. You know, if you talk to my 13 year old, he is only communicating through discord with his friends and through games, right? So a shift towards much more digital communication, this will continue. This is both an opportunity for brands. It's also a big challenge for brands because they're trying to keep up with a forever changing landscape of communication that is rapidly shifting under their feet. And of course, some things are gonna go back to normal. I can't wait to go back to a bar or a restaurant. I think it's the number one thing on my list. I'm sure many are the same way. But regardless, this, the pandemic has been a forcing functioning that's really accelerated this move towards a more digitally improved world at where the most important differentiator is a better and better customer experience. So we are increasingly on a global stage. Um, if you kind of think back even into the early 2000s, many brands were competing at a local stage, right? They were competing, they could get away with crappy CX because they didn't have a lot of competition. Over the last 15 plus years, that competition became more regional where you started to see more competition within your country, within your region. And that became, customer experience became more and more competitive. In the last few years, we've seen that accelerate even more. And especially with the pandemic where we're now competing on a global stage. For those of us who live and breathe in the startup world, like many of you, we now see startups forming all over the world. Right before the pandemic, I was down in Sao Paulo. There are tons of amazing startups that are serving global consumers, global people, global customers. Um, that means that as a brand, everything is becoming commodified. The products, the services, the technology are becoming increasingly commodified. And that means that as a brand, customer experience is becoming increasingly important. There's a data point I like to talk about here, which is more than half of all consumers tell us when we survey them that if a brand screws up one customer experience, they're likely to switch and go to another brand. So brand allegiance, brand affinity is dying off. It's really, really important that we are continuously focused on not screwing up for our customers. Do you think that's at uh, same uh, you know, to be true in the B2B world as well. Like, I mean, I, I totally get it, right? I mean, we are in this fast paced environment where communications, you know, at her fingertips at every second, it is easy to switch brands, especially as a consumer, if you've had a bad experience, but in the B2B world where so many of us live in our careers, do you think we have, you know, it's, it's really that one bad experience or do we have a bit more patience? We have more patience, but only because the switching costs are higher, right? Like if, if you think about it, I can switch shoes, shoe buying, my shoe buying habits or where I get my takeout food very easily because there are so many choices and there's no switching costs. In B2B, there's switching costs. So the some of this stickiness that brands, you know, B2B companies enjoy is really about that it's hard to unravel them. Uh, I don't think companies should rely on that as their retention strategy though, right? Certainly a lot of large B2B companies do, right? That's part of their retention strategies, get in there, make it very hard to rip and replace them. I would advocate that that's a bad way to ensure your customers stick with you. You're much better off focusing on removing friction, making them happy because eventually they will get so annoyed with you that they'll leave you. Yeah. And then they'll let everyone know. <laughs> and then they let everyone know. And, and I think like one of the things I'll talk about later is that, you know, focusing on customers and retention is also doing that is a really important thing. Having that customer lens protect my customers at all costs is equally important because it really turns into acquisition because your number one way to grow is to get your customers to be your advocates, particularly in B2B. That is hugely important. We all know this. Good customer stories are the, the lifeblood of our industry. So. Oh, I love that you just said that. It's like music to my ears, storytelling, my huge passion. All right. Keep going. True. Yes. All right. Great. So um, 
not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. I think well, there's been just so many changes here, right? Acceleration, deceleration, all of that. But underlying all this is this realization that CX is, is really the number one most important thing. And I broadly, I, I defined CX broadly, as I mentioned at the beginning of this. This is not just CX from like your customer service team has got good CSAT. This is, are you creating a great customer experience for your customers across all those touch points? The key is many brands aren't realizing this. They, they, they think it, but they're not owning it and doing something about it. So super important that brands be thinking about and doing something about this. So if everything has changed, but really nothing has changed, right? Because underlying all these trend shifts that we've seen, we're seeing a few different, you know, there's sort of the core fundamentals that have been true and been increasingly true. And I think will be even more true as we go forward. So first of all, customers need you to be listening to them. And that is a really important thing. Like understanding and improving customer experience, you have to actually experience your customer's pain. You have to feel what's going on with them and you have to invest in solving that and chipping away at it. Second is your employees really need you to enable their success. So this is very much about technology, of course, giving your employees the technology they need to create great customer experience, whatever touch point that is. But it's also about giving them tools to better communicate with customers. I like to say that at this point, you know, in 2021, a customer, good customer experience and a customer's expected experience that they can stand on any street corner in any part of the world with their cell phone. They can decide whatever channel they want. They can communicate, reach out to you. They wanna be able to reach out on any channel and they wanna get a personalized real time or near real time response quickly. That is the level of expectations customers have. Um, we're, none of us are meeting that, none of us are, but that's that level. So we need to give our employees those tools to enable them to try and meet that expectation. Your, your core fundamentals as a business, your, what differentiates you hasn't changed throughout this pandemic, but how you express them has. Like a good example from one of our customers, Conrad Electronics, which is out of Germany, they, that one of their core uh, value props is they have a lot of expertise in electronics. They're a huge electronics retailer. Um, their customers rely on them, would go in and get really uh, great demos of these electronics to help them make decisions. They obviously can't do that anymore. They had to pivot very quickly, but they brought that core value prop online into video demos that people can easily, um, easily book. This has been a big win for them. It's, it's allowed them again to differentiate quickly and to really create a great experience that was their core value prop, but expressed in a different way. So underlying all this, agility, flexibility, constant evolution. This is something we, uh, you know, startups, many of you are startups um, that we all live and breathe, but I think we have to be even faster and we have to be really focused on how we're doing that for our customers. I'm going to, so it's interesting because I remember probably eight plus years ago, I was at an event and we talked to some, I can't remember who it was talking about, it was real time information, how you'd be able to walk into a store and get a notification about a promotion that was happening on the, in the store. And that was at the time really like, oh my gosh, this was revolutionary. Now it's a little bit of like, yeah, we get it. And if friends don't do that personalized experience, um, you know, they, they really haven't figured it out. But how, do, like, can you give us some examples of how this can translate to the world of, of B2B tech? So our customer, like we're, we're, you know, how does that work when we're not interacting with, with consumers in the same way? Like the principles are the same, we're all human, but how does that, how does that uh, translate if you have any examples? Yeah, and actually, I think a, a good example and what, what I would like to talk about is Zendesk because we are a B2B company and, and I'm going to talk to you about sort of how we focused on growth and new reality in this new reality, because I think it probably applies to what many other B2B companies are doing. Does that sound good? Sounds amazing. Okay, cool. So I'm going to make it real because I'll, I'll share my pain with you all so you can see uh, how we dealt with this and what we're really focused on. So this growth in this new reality. So I think three, three areas, um, focusing on what matters and then letting go of everything else, hugely important, particularly during a pandemic, but excuse me, that should be something that's a mantra for all of us too. Viewing everything you do through the customer lens and really feeling and experiencing that customer pain and saying, how am I gonna solve that pain? And then data is incredibly important here. Letting the data tell you the what, but 
equally, if not more important, the why. And this is super important for how we as B2B companies or B2C companies figure out what we need to do for our consumers. So, all right, I'm gonna talk about Zendesk, as I said, I'm gonna make this real. So just to set the stage, um, pandemic hit, kind of started coming around late February uh, in the US at least. Um, guess what, Zendesk's global user conference was March 3rd um, in Miami. We'd been planning it forever. We had a huge launch coming. We had thousands of people flying in from all over the world. I got the uh, honor of canceling that less than three days before it happened. Um, talk about pissed off customers. We had people flying in, they were in the air when we canceled the conference. Um, in retrospect, good idea because other Miami events ended up being super spreaders that made the front page in the New York Times. So we were, we were good to cancel it, but um, that set the stage for the pivot we had to make. We quickly went and we were doing all sorts of stuff to try and be helpful. We, we took all of our offline activities, B2B companies, as we know, live and breathe a ton of offline, particularly if you're more enterprise focused. Um, we rushed, put everything online. We had more campaigns. We said, how can we we'll do more customer meetups? Let's just bring it online. And what we really found quickly is, wow, we're confusing the heck out of our customers and we're creating confusion and we're actually wasting a lot of resources. Um, so we took a step back and we looked at our data and we talked to our customers and we, and we said, oh, wait, wait a minute. What we're not doing well here is we're trying to just, instead of pivoting and and adapting to a new normal. We're just trying to squeeze everything we used to do into a new normal. So we, we looked at this data, we realized that we actually had a lot of opportunity here to better serve our customers and to better meet their needs. I'll give a couple of examples. There's tons of examples, but uh, cause we've done a lot in this last year. And to be fair, our clear, our growth has actually accelerated in the pandemic. Some of that has been because of COVID, of course, demand, but we actually, our data is telling us some of this is just because we're doing a lot more to really solve these core customer pain points. So customer meetups, they are lifeblood for us, right? I, as I mentioned, customers sell to your, I always like to say customers in B2B are your, um, they're your best salespeople because if they're a happy customer, they're gonna tell other customers about how great you are and tell their story. And that is going to uh, make, make other customers wanna buy much more than all the salespeople and the marketing people in the world can. Well, we had customer meetups. We used to do hundreds of them all over the world. Um, they're expensive, they're time consuming, all of that. When we first did it, we tried to replicate that online. Um, again, expensive, time consuming. And our customers were kind of annoyed, like, oh, I don't wanna do more of this. I don't wanna do more of that. What we realized is we could innovate here and we could create much larger events that were like a, a, a very large regional or even global customer meetup where we shared a lot of learnings together. And then we use technology to do breakouts on specific topics, whether it's industry specific or regional specific, and we've done both. And our customers are much happier with this. All of a sudden they're saying, oh, there's so much this is great. I'm getting much more access to a bigger global community, which I need. I'm getting access to a lot more data and community that I just didn't have before. And um, I'm not having to travel and go somewhere and spend a lot of my time. It's a much more shorter, you know, um, time commitment for me. So we're getting more pipeline, we're getting better ROI, and we're also meeting customer, customer demand. Um, that's just one example that really has, has, was, you know, in my world in marketing, we did the same thing on the product side, right? We, we looked in and we said, we have this whole roadmap that we're rolling out. Let's show that roadmap to our customers. And our customers were like, that's great, but I need help with a few things, right? First, I have suddenly have my entire workforce is remote. I need to shift my, my workforce remote help. So we, pivoted, we rolled out a free remote support bundle. We used the data available to say, where are our customers having problems here? When we rolled out this remote support bundle, it had all the collaboration tools, some of which we were already been building, but we packaged them together. We managed to get this out in five days, right? We stopped our development on other things. We got a remote support bundle out in five days. This was great because it was both a, a retention initiative um, and as I said, an acquisition initiative because it helped our customers who suddenly had to have all their employees remote working with each other, collaborating over Slack, collaborating over different tools. But it also was a great way for us to get out there and companies that were having to pivot in their own world who weren't our customers got excited about this and came on and, and joined us. So 
all that kind of focusing on what matters, um, really to do that, you need to view everything through that customer lens. At Zendesk, as, this, as the pandemic hit and as we came into like the new normal, we, we really rallied the organization around five principles. That first was protecting and retaining our customer base above all else. Like what could we do to help them? And so, yes, we get rolled out a remote support bundle. We also um, changed our roadmap. Messaging, social messaging is something that's been exploding in our space. Like people want to commune over social messaging. So we pivoted a lot more resources to roll out uh, better social messaging, much more integrated into our broader systems. And that's been a big win for our customers and big win for us. And again, that retention of those customers is great acquisition for me. I'm a CMO, my job is to acquire, but because I can go out with something that's great experience for customers and something that is very timely and very needed right now, that allows me to acquire a lot more. The second thing we focused on is simplicity in everything we do. And I think, I think this is where a lot of companies, particularly as they get bigger, start to fall down. And Zendesk has certainly had our share of this. You know, you start out as a company, you have one product, super easy to sell. You know, all you're doing is just getting that one thing I'm trying to get them to do over and over. Everything is easier, right? The bigger you get, the more complex things get and you start to layer on debt. That debt is technical debt, but it's also customer debt. You're creating customer pain. We did a ton of work and we took resources. So all those marketing resources that I saved from not having to do you know, a thousand customer meetups in, in person, I poured all those resources into, let's solve our customer pain points in our funnel, in the customer journey. And again, this applies, like this is B2B in, live and in action. Everybody wants things quickly and fast and they need it sooner. Um, so we put a lot of effort towards understanding where our customers experiencing pain. A, a great example of where they experience pain um, was our buying experience, right? This is where I, I, every B2B company that doesn't sell just through sales assisted, but even in sales assisted, but both sales assisted and self-serve should obsess about making it super easy to buy. And we often fall down on this. Um, my old employer, Adobe, huge company, lots of, you know, huge market cap. Sure, they, product innovation was big, but focusing on making it super easy and seamless for people to trial and buy was really, really critical for them. Really big financial win for them. We've been applying that same lens because we did user testing. There, there's a video, um, I like to call it a revenue avoidance initiative. <laughs> you know, we try to look for those pain points that become, those are revenue avoidance initiatives. Those are places where we've screwed up. We've created a bad experience and customers are abandoning us. So we had a video that went, a user testing video that went viral in our company of a woman trying to purchase from us, trying to purchase a simple product from us um, in our increasingly complex product ecosystem. It's a 12 minute video. She couldn't figure it out, <laughs> it's super painful, right? Um, this is where as B2B companies, we can look at that and say, oh my gosh, I can throw all the customer meetups in the world. If they can't buy, what am I doing, right? We did the same thing with our trial. We did the same thing with our onboarding. And by focusing on all that, taking that customer lens and feeling the customer's pain, we've been able to make tons of improvement. Can we just pause on that for a moment for a minute? Because I think you know, that's something that people don't do enough of, right? It's yeah. you know, how many times, you know, and for everyone listening, I'd love for you to sort of think about how many times you've redone your sales process, you've, you know, you've had pitch competition, you bought all these things, and and you've never actually sat in your buyer's shoes to figure out what that process looks like. So actually watching someone try and buy your product, it must have been so cringy when you were like, just click on this button over here, hidden under 17 different buttons, right? Right. It's very eye-opening. Yeah, and I encourage it, it is so eye-opening. And it's so, and we all, you know, if you live and breathe your own experience all the time, you start to do shortcuts to avoid all that. So it's very important to put a, a newbie perspective in there. Um, it's really important not, you know, I'm talking a lot about what we did in our actual, like, you know, the, the actual checkout, but the same thing applies to legal. It applies to, you know, how would I do contracts as a B2B company? Um, 
we found a lot of pain there too, right? This is very common for companies. They think it makes tons of sense to them, but when they put on the customer lens, they're like, oh my gosh, I'm making it a nightmare for my company, my customers to actually do a contracting process with me. What am I doing, right? Very common. So across the board, you can really identify those pain points um, and, and really improve those. Um, yeah. And one thing you called out was the buyer experience. And again, like I just, this is very nuanced, right? But we often think about, you know, how we sell, how we sell. And it's not about that. It's more about helping our customers buy the way they want to buy and helping them use the product the way they need to use the product. Yes. And we don't think about that. Right. And, and especially like as, and, and companies, as they do, they, they say, oh, I'm going to add this other thing. I'm going to add that other thing. Cause we're all constantly trying to grow, right. Where our jobs of course are to, you know, dramatically grow bookings and revenue all the time. Um, and as we layer more on, we're often diluting the customer experience and hurting it. And yet we don't realize that because we're so focused on the new thing. Like I always say, as companies go into multi-product experiences, I'm always like, don't forget about your 800 pound gorilla. Your, your core prize product is absolutely the number one most important thing. So as you start to layer on add-ons and products and new things I wanna sell and oh, a different buyer because my VC told me that if I doubled my TAM, I'm gonna do really well. All that's great, but if you forget about your 800 pound gorilla, you're just dead. You know, you're going to end up totally screwing up your business. Um, yeah. So talk to those customers, and and that kind of leads to my last discussion point. So underneath all that um, is is leading with time to value. You know, is uh, on this customer lens is time to value is an incredibly important metric. Um, you know, this is something that Zendesk won with in the early days. We were competing against you know. Uh, legacy software that was, you know, oh gosh, I get value in six months. You know, that was unacceptable to people in this new world. Um, we obviously beat that by a lot, but even still, what we found is everybody's getting better at time to value, right? Because the, the world is demanding time to value. Time to value is defined as how soon till I actually get the core value of your offering. So we, we've been mapping out our time to value and saying where are the pain points, where are the chunks of value uh, gap or time that we can cut out, right? So set up and deployment, like as I mentioned, trial was a big one. Our trial had gotten more complicated and we realized our trial needs to be almost an automatic setup for you. And we're definitely not where we wanna be, frankly, but this is a thing, again, I think a thing where companies can fall down where they don't realize that if I don't get that customer into like solving the fundamental thing that they want to solve with my product within hours, days, I'm going to lose them, right? Any trial funnel shows you that, right? Like we lose like 80% of people <laughs> like out the gate. So that is a core thing that you should all, every brand, every B2B company, every B2C company should obsess about is if I'm not getting company, if I'm not getting people value for a month, I, I'm going to just lose a ton of people. Totally. Think about how many times you go to a website to like check something out or download an app. And if you aren't getting value, like if you can't use it within the first 30 seconds, boom, you're on to something else. So exactly. exactly. I love that you track it. So you're tracking, and this is something that I, I, you know, in most of the companies that I work with, this is something they miss out on a lot. So they aren't tracking both. There's two metrics that we recommend. I'm curious as to what you, you're tracking there is, you know, the actual time to value and making sure that it's within a reasonable time, depending on the cost of your product. So we're looking at 15 to 30 days, yeah. ideally. And then also how many customers make it to that first value point in that time. Yeah, we, we track we, and we, we segment it to your point, like, cause you, you can't expect a large complex deal um, with a big enterprise to be like, they got value in hours, you know, yeah. um, it's, it's just, um, on, <laughs> they have to align with like 50 people at their company before they're even allowed to do that. But they should be able to get up get those people. Yeah. So we look and we say like more complex use cases in the enterprise might be a month, two months. Right. But a small startup, it's literally hours. The expectation is hours. And we do, we track how many people, we track these drop-offs in our funnel. And it's, it's very eye-opening. Like I've never seen a funnel where it's like, oh, wow, um, we maintain, retained 90% of people because there are always tire kickers. But you can have dramatic improvement with simple change. And I think the simple change 
is to say, like for our case, how can I have them start solving tickets within an hour? Like the second they can start solving a customer's problem, they are hooked, <laughs> right? Totally. If, if, I give, if it takes them three weeks to do that, I've already lost them. So that's the kind of like value we should all be focusing on. But even um, with that big enterprise customer, like every single one of those people has their own, maybe it's, maybe it's an emotional impact, right? Like, oh, I've been having so much frustration not being able to man, like get people even just thinking about this as a priority. So the second you start to get those 50 people aligned, that's an emotional value to that person who brought you in. And so they're not using your product because they are enterprise and you, you need to integrate with 17,000 things. But for them, it's like relief that now it's taken seriously. Now this problem is going to be fixed. So that's, yeah, that's exactly. And, and, you know, you're hitting. An, so, so there's so much uh, like uh, time to value optimization. You can also do even on your sales process. Like if you're selling to an enterprise, you need to think about, and, you know, we all have these cringeworthy moments. I just had one um, where, you know, we're, we're, we have a customer, they're having a problem. We want to solve it. I, I can see the problem very clearly. And then we go in with a story that's like too high level. The customer's annoyed. They're a startup. And we're going in with a very much like, let us reintroduce our messaging to you, you know, and it's like absolutely not reading your audience right, right? You're, you're totally not reading your audience right and they're super annoyed and you're gonna lose them, right? But if you go in, you have to read that audience, you have to know that specific customer, especially if it's a larger customer, but all customers, you have to know them, you have to read that and then you have to bring in the right people and the right message to make them feel excited about it as opposed to my cookie cutter approach that's like, oh, here, I'm gonna tell you what you already could have read on our website, you know? Um, so underlying all of this is data, 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 like super important. I'm very much a data-driven marketer, data-driven leader. Um, what I mean by what and why here. So startups tend to be all about the what data, right? It's like usage data, profile data. What are they doing on my website? Oh, I can measure where they're dropping off in my MQL to this, to that rate has changed. Um, but the why data is so important here. And you're, you're a success leader, so I think you can probably relate to this more than anyone, is actually talking to the customers and interacting with them is where you actually learn what to do. So when we say focus on what matters and view everything through the customer lens, if I'm not actually talking to my customers, I'm, I'm just going on my gut or I'm going on data that might be misleading. right? So I've rolled out tons of changes based on gut and regretted almost every one of them. When I actually survey my customers, talk to them in person, do panels, um, user testing, as I said, huge one. I, it's, it's always a win to do that. So I really advocate that people have to have both sides of that. Big companies better, tend to be better at that what data because they have research teams and all this. Small companies tend to be better at the, or excuse me, at the why data. Small companies tend to be better at the what data. You need to map the two together to really have a win. Okay, so just tell me really quickly. So, you know, we all can't be in the world. I remember when I was um, at Influitive early days, uh, you know, it was me and seven product people. I would always bring one of our developers or our project managers over into some of our customer calls. And it was incredible, right? Because customer starts to, to explain a challenge they're having, get off the call and the developer's like, that's so easy to fix. Like, give me an hour right? You know, that's like the best, right? As you start to scale up, obviously that's totally unexpected and, and, and unreasonable, but as you get to a big company, how do you bring in your product team so that way they can still feel connected to the customers? Um, they can still hear because the way the language your customers use when they're describing certain situations is so critical to that problem. So what are some good examples of how you don't just have your customer success team and support team facing the interfacing with the customers, you bring it to some of the other core areas of your company. Yeah, so no matter what, yeah. So there, there are kind of standard things like voice of the customer, of course, that you bring to your product team that you know success and other teams work on, which is we're gonna aggregate the voice of the customer and we're gonna bring that to you. I think that's great. Um, to your point, I think the product teams need to live and breathe it. Um, good product teams will, will want to. Your key is how do you stretch them? Um, where I've seen people make mistakes is, you know, they have a cab, 
and it's the same, it's the same like 20 customers that they've had for eight years and they're all power users. And they're like, gosh, our cab tells us to do this. And I, you know, I think a good cab needs to be diverse. It needs to be representative of your, of your entire base. Um, and I think you just need to bring product people to very key customers. Um, what we tend to do is very large, important strategic deals is where our product teams spend the most time. Right, and they're going to live and breathe that and understand that pain. But at the same time, we also say you have to come into some of our small deals too because they represent a ton of our business. And so we have specific people in product who are very focused on SMB as a business. You know, that's a business I run, like uh, including sales side, and I'm very passionate about. Um, we both bring them kind of voice to the customer data, but we also they come in, they talk to some of our top SMB customers. And they learn. And I, you know, you're hitting on like the best thing you can do is put an engineer in a customer support position for a day. Um, and all of a sudden, all the bugs are going to get fixed, right? <laughs> so it's very important that you at least have, you have to have formal mechanisms for doing that. Product marketing also plays a good role here. We have a broad, you know, broader product marketing team. They can kind of play the role of product and then feed that data back to product. That's really great. Um, I love that idea, mix up your cab. I think that your customer advisory board for anyone who doesn't know what cab stands for. That's a great, that's a great insight. You know, even like maybe it's a good opportunity to bring in a customer who isn't really so happy, right? Let's let them involve, you know, get them involved. You like, I saw your face, you're like, yeah, do it. You have to do it, right? If we just bring in the people who love us and are like advocates, you know, that that's great. But then we're just all drinking our own Kool-Aid and getting excited. You should yeah. bring in the customer who's mad at you, <laughs> you know, and, ta and talk to them and say, why are you mad at us? And call it mad. <laughs> Such yeah. a cat. We can call it mad. <laughs> oh, um, mad. Yeah. Someone asked a question um, where, you know, if you bring your customers in, if you ask for their input, you know, are you then obligated to deliver? Um, you know, I have some thoughts on that, but I'll go for it, Jeff. I mean, you should always feel obligated, but we can't solve everybody's problems, right? It's just impossible. Um, and, you know, you just need to be, oh, I, I'm a big believer, transparency, openness, honesty. Like, I, I think we just need to be honest with our customers, just like we want companies, vendors we work with to be honest with us. I don't want someone lying to me and telling me this is coming really soon and it's on our roadmap. If it's not on the roadmap, tell me it's not on the roadmap. Help me find a way to solve it that might not be me, but like might be one of my technology alliance partners, et cetera. So um, what we do need to do though, is aggregate the pain from customers and bring it to product and influence their roadmap. That is like the number one thing we can do there. Product's super busy. They got a million things going on. They want to hear from us. Um, they don't want to hear where, where, where go-to-market teams make a mistake is they lose one customer deal over one thing and that becomes the hot new thing that they want fixed, right? No, that's not fair to product. That's not going to work. What we need to do is aggregate our learnings from customer pain, bring it to them, stack rank it, show them data again, like this many customers are having problem with this thing. It's costing us this much money. If we solve it, we're going to make this much more money. Our conversion is going to go up and our retention is going to go up. Product loves that. They're data driven as well. So that I think that's the way you need to solve, you need to approach it. Yeah. So often customers are saying, "Hey, I just wish the that it would just do this, or do you, can I have this feature?" And often in customer success, we are you know we're like, "Okay, let me let me make a feature request." Whereas if you speak to people on product, they'd rather understand that pain that you talked about, right? And so sometimes when customers are asking for a specific feature really they're looking to solve a pain and they're just thinking two steps ahead. And so it's really important to ask, what are you trying to solve for? Right. And then getting, yeah, exactly. And then understanding what that is, because then if you roll out a new feature later, you can say, hey, this is what we rolled out to solve your pain or so often we actually already have some functionality that can solve for that pain. You just weren't aware of it and you can solve it already without having to bombard your product team. Absolutely. Never go to a, <laughs> never go to a product team with the solution. Like that is the core thing there. Like go to them with the problem statement, the customer problem statement, they will figure out the solution. Absolutely. All right. Um, I'm going to just power through this. We're almost done. Okay. Then we can go to more Q and A. So, yeah. So just, to, I'm going to share, we have um, CX trends reports. So of our 170,000, 160 something thousand customers, every, um, 
every year for the last three years, we've been releasing a trends report. What, what we look at is about 90,000 of those customers allow us to um, study them and study their customer behavior. We also survey them and talk to leaders in the industry to, to understand trends. Um, the report comes out next week, um, January 21st. You can get it at zendesk.com slash benchmark. Um, you have a lot, of, a lot of in-depth trends by industry. You can actually benchmark yourself against your industry. Um, you can go there now, but that's the 2020 data. So 2021 comes next week. It's, you're sort of the first to hear some of this. I'm just going to show you just some very high level to close out here. A few, a few of the trends that have, that have come up from this report. Obviously, a, mo a lot more will be there um, on the 21st. So, First one is just obviously CX is becoming just an increasingly important thing. We talked about this. Um, what we've seen is a 20% increase in inbound customer inquiries um, to our customers. 20% doesn't sound that huge, but it's actually huge, right? This is like a step function up in inquiries um, since the pandemic. We actually don't see it slowing down. Um, so we've seen people across all age bands, you know, people tend to think, oh, 70 year olds aren't reaching out to, out to companies via social messaging. You know what they start, they are because they're adopting a lot more. So this has been a big shift. And what we see is companies increasingly saying the CX is more important than what is a year ago. 67% are saying it's more important. Um, what we also know is that consumers, 71% of consumers are saying they're willing to spend more with companies that give them good customer experience. Um, I like to look at that at the flip side, which is you don't give a good customer experience, you're gonna lose your customer, right? That's key. And, and as I said, switching costs as they get lower and lower, even in B2B, that's a big issue. Second is this, we're seeing a shift in how people are, are con um, working with brands, with, with businesses. So we're in a more conversational world. We've seen a huge uptick in adoption of social media um, technology to interact with customers. So 110% spike. This was already growing before the pandemic. It's dramatically growing. And this is a really important thing that companies and consumers want to connect with brands um, over the same th same ways that they're connecting with their um, with their friends and family. So that's a big shift that we're seeing. I just the key point here is this is forever evolving, and it's really important that no matter if you're B two C B two B, you have to be on top of this and, and working and, and meeting your um, consum your your buyer where they're at. This emphasis on agility is a really big one. Um, 85% of teams are, have had to make major shifts in what they're doing. That's adding more channels in our world, more ways they communicate. This is across sales, marketing, CX, um, moving to much more proactive support to solve people's problems. And then using technology to enable, en enable people to self-serve more. Um, this is something we do at Zendesk increasingly is, you know, again, trying to have our customers rely on us to answer every question is very painful. So we're investing using our own technology more in how do we use AI? How do we use bots? How do we use self-serve? Because our customers do not want to wait. They want us to tell. And how do we use community, things like that? Do not want to wait. They want to find the answer themselves and they, they want to find it very quickly. So big shift on agility here. Um, Last, uh, second to last here is uh, the future of work is now, this is really this trend around how everyone is moving to a much more distributed way of working, uh, hugely important. But the problem, what we're finding is that people still don't have the tools. Maybe us in tech, uh, core tech have these tools, even though we've struggled with it ourselves. But about half of agents, and that's agents broadly defined, uh, don't, you know, these are people working with end customers, it's fine, they don't have the right tools to work successfully. And 41% of managers don't have the adequate tools to measure. So when I talk about data driven here, if you actually don't have the data to understand that what and that why, you're really at a huge disadvantage. And I think this is something we all need to, to focus on. Uh, Last trend here, and then I'll close out. We go to questions. Just we're at this digital tipping point. So obviously we're just seeing a huge adoption in digital. You can look at the uh, growth trajectories of SaaS companies that focus on digital. All have gone up this last year. That's obviously been great for people like me, but um, also just is a real shift that we're seeing. So what we're seeing is that companies are saying they're going to be rap more rapidly adopting digital technology. So 75% of decision makers are telling us that COVID-19 is going to speed up their technology adoption. Of those 
50% are saying it'll accelerate it by one to three years, but another 25% are accelerating four to seven years. So digital transformation, and for those of you who sell in, in digital transformation, this is uh, a, a key opportunity. One of the things we've seen in our own, in our own buyers is a shift in you know, time to value, I mentioned, but also time to adoption, like companies coming in and telling us, you know, before would be, let's talk about this, you know, especially if they're a larger company, we'll, we'll consider buying this and we'll buy it in six months. A, a lot of companies coming in saying, all right, three weeks from now, I want to be live because they've had to, but we can, we're, we're expecting that to continue because what people have seen throughout this pandemic is adopting digital first here has been a big win for them. Those businesses that have done that are doing better. And so we expect this, this sort of an accelerating trend that we'll see uh, happen more. All right, um, I think I'm gonna skip this. Um, you can, we can send these slides out for those who wanna read it. Like really reiterate some of the things that we're seeing um, in our own customer base. They're staying connected to customers and they're setting their teams up for success. But I, I think since we're running a little long, I'll skip this. Um, Kind of closing out here, four things just to remind everyone. Customers need you to be listening to them. This should be across everything we do. Again, from how you do your legal contracts all the way down to how you, um, you know, do your renewals at the end. You need to be really focused on, on their pain and re re uh, reducing it, getting that time to value as short as possible. Employees need you to enable their success. We often fall down here. We're like, we're gonna be very customer focused and we forget to invest in the technology and the tools for our employees to do that. The core business fundamentals haven't changed but how you express them has. And again, number one thing here is that agility, flexibility and the constant evolution um, are gonna be here to stay. So I'm gonna end here and turn it back over to you, Julie. You can all see this if you wanna mark that down. If it's interesting to you, you can check it out on the 21st. Thank you so much for giving us a sneak peek of that. Appreciate it. Sure. Um, there is a question uh, that I wanna address. Um, Brandon asked, are there any best, uh, best practices for CX to share on rolling out a community forum to customer base? Community is a big, a big topic. Yeah, of course, I should just say go use Zendesk Gather product, but I, <laughs> I won't. Uh, well, I already did, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I, I think community is incredibly important. Um, and it's something that I did a lot of in my B2C world, but also um, I think B2B companies, uh, it's, it's super important. I, I, there's a few things that we need to think about here. First of all, is how do we, how do we make communities both digitally super easy and fast and awesome to use. Um, think of that as how are we connecting our customers you know, with each other very efficiently? Um, but how do we map that off into their real world experiences as well? So uh, you know, real world can't be totally real world right now, but one of the big things we focus on with community is, yes, we wanna have a digital community where everybody's communicating, but people really wanna know each other and meet each other and, and build networks with each other, right? So we do a lot where we say, let's create a community around an event, but then let's connect people through Slack communities or through other places where they can have a private community where they're continuing to communicate. You can do email communities too, right? You can do any kind of community you want, but I think it's super important to say, what's our kind of core community where anyone can find anything um, and, and access other experts who can answer my questions, but then how do I make it more personal for people either um, by connecting them to others so they can have ongoing kind of circles that they, they, they discuss things with. It's super hard. Not many companies do it well. It's something we're continuously trying to improve ourselves. It's a big actual focus area for us. Yeah, launching a community is really hard because I used to joke that one of the, the biggest fears of a community manager, the question get asked, gets asked and, and no one answers. And I remember uh, when we launched our community at Eloqua, like, 18 years ago or something. Um, I remember literally calling customers and saying, hey, we have a community. Will you go ask a question and then calling another customer? Hey, there's a question on the community. Can you go answer it? So, you know, engaging your advocates and having a core group of customers who are committed to helping you launch the community is going to be also just one tip that I would add. 
I um, agree with I agree with that. That the, the you are nothing without your power moderators. Really, is I, I would I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so William's asked you know, if you can talk about some of the other social channels, and I think that's actually really hot topic. I mean, there's Facebook, um, but then there's also Twitch and Discord, and um, you know, I know that TikTok is one that's that that's coming um, that's emerging. So any insights you can provide to them uh, to ask around how to engage with their customers on, the, on those platforms. Yeah, I mean, so I, I think it's very important that you meet customers where they are, right, to that point. And so, you know, companies like Zendesk, we offer these integrations. We, you know, we just did a very large partnership with Facebook. So we have, you know, very, um, Pretty robust in a messenger and WhatsApp integrations. Those are probably our two most popular, but we also like, you have to also look at your specific user base and you mentioned Discord, that's a good example. We have a partnership with Discord as well. We have a Discord integration so that um, our customers can actually just, you know, if you're a gamer, like my 13 year old, you don't ever leave Discord. So if you are, you know, you need to be as the brand to provide great CX in where that person is. If they do everything in Discord, you need to be there. So I think what I would advocate for people, um, there are a variety of channels. There's both the mainstream channels like the Facebook, WhatsApp, et cetera. Instagram is gonna be increasingly one. Facebook's been rolling out Instagram, you know, uh, business messaging. That's something we've just launched and, you know, will be, we think bigger and bigger, particularly for like direct to consumer uh, companies are gonna use that the most. Um, but also there's more niche, right? These Twitches, Discords, et cetera. You need to understand your user base and go, I have limited resources. So where am I gonna find the most bang for my buck, right? If I am a beauty retailer, um, probably Instagram, right? If I'm a gamer, obviously it's gonna be Twitch, Discord. So companies like ours are saying, we wanna be everywhere for you. We're gonna provide you the tools to have that communication. What you as a brand need to do is say, which are the ones that are most important to me so that I can invest in those um, and be live with them. Uh, yeah, it also depends of course on like where you live. Like when we introduced WhatsApp, we introduced it in Brazil for a reason because if you've ever been to Brazil, like nobody does anything except WhatsApp there. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's how they live. It's how they buy things. It's how they order their food. It's how they communicate with their friends. It's how they do everything. So it's incredible, like you just can't be a brand in Brazil without that WhatsApp communication. Not here in the US, right? I mean, WhatsApp is getting bigger here, but it's still uh, not as big. Yeah, so I would echo, you know, something you said earlier when we were talking about product is talk to your customers, right? So if you don't know where your customers are, asking them, hey, where do you like to live on social? Where do you find yourself most often? So that way, you can, um, you know, you can be where they are because it is hard to be everywhere, right? You can't be on every single social platform and it wouldn't make sense to. Yeah, and you almost confuse your customers too much if you're like everywhere. I mean, I suppose if you're a very broad offering, sure. But yeah, I agree. You have to kind of put prioritize and decide. Yeah, absolutely. So we only have a few minutes left. If anyone else has any questions, feel free to throw them in. We're, we're, we've, we've gotten to um, a lot of them. Um, I have a, a quick question if you don't mind. Um, I work with, you know, since most of my career and work with most of my customers on the post sales motion, you know, marketing is still pretty focused on new leads, right? I mean, that they often get measured still on new leads. So would you give any advice to marketers? Because you, know, you said it before, right? When the pandemic hit, we did start to see a shift in organizations seeing, oh my gosh, I have to protect my base, my base yeah. of my customers. This is where my revenue is and we can, let's grow our base. Um, and so are, you know, amongst your communities of marketers, are you starting to see that shift where marketers are saying, whoa, hang on a second, maybe I need to start driving more revenue from our existing customers. And how are we doing that? Absolutely. And, you know, it's like, you, you kind of can come into a company and, a, you know, Zendesk, I joined four years ago and came in and was like, where's the retention marketing team? <laughs> like in my mind, that's something marketers do, right? And um, 
it's important for marketers. Marketers can add a ton of value on expansion, on retention. Um, they can, especially with smaller customers, right? Where it's just too expensive for success teams to, to reach out to those customers. Um, or you just can't staff it up or even the AEs can't have relationships with those, you know, tons of small customers. Marketing can play a really good role there of triggering communications, using data to predictively identify risk and trigger out or, or particularly identify opportunity and trigger out. I think that's a trend that's absolutely happening um, across the industry. I, I know all of my employers have done that, but I also know a lot of my CMO colleagues at other SaaS companies. We talk about this. This is something that's happening. Um, success teams are, are, are embracing that, I think. I think what they're seeing is, oh, great. I can't touch all those people. It's too much. I just, I don't have the time. I got to focus on the more most important customers, but I can leverage marketing to do that for me. Um, so I, I do think that that's one thing. Of course, it's important though for marketers to, have to always focus on acquisition. Like it's our number one job. So I, I tend to like, sometimes, you know, it's harder <laughs> to acquire. So we always have to say, yes, we want you to do that. But so what I end up doing is I end up carving out teams that focus on that. So their KPIs around that and other teams. I'm like, your job is new business. If, you know, I'm a big believer in aligning KPIs and not giving any wiggle room around them. Like if we need you to get new business, that's all you do. <laughs> Yeah. No, I like that. And I, I always, we say the same things, right? So if a sales rep is focused on bringing in new business and upselling, you know, increased existing business, they're going to go to what's potentially easier to hit their number. And so you either have to say you have to hit both numbers before you can get your accelerators. If you, you know, you're not big enough to have segregated teams or you have a hunting and you have a farming team. Exactly. Match. And I love that idea of like having marketing align with each of those teams because it is do still do find that it's a forgotten group, right? You know, you kind of have customer success and account management, they're sort of in their own island and they're like, anything you can give us, but having a dedicated team focused on their customer experience and how to market to your existing customers and how to create advocates, advocates which will hopefully feed that front of funnel as well. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Amazing. Well, um, you know, I, I think you know, there's, there's one more question around sort of the, the, the on your website chat, um, you know, yep. any thoughts around the, you know, the, that bot that we see, I think, does Zendesk have one of those? Yeah, it's part of our offering. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and we're moving to a much more integrated messaging bot because it, it, yeah, super impactful. We use it ourselves on our website. Um, you know, I think it's both valuable from a sales and marketing perspective as an acquisition tool. It's also valuable um, for, for uh, support and CX teams, right? To be interacting with customers uh, who have issues. Uh, key things I think to keep in mind there, um, bots are your friend, um, and, but you need to do them right, right? So um, customers, we, we study this a lot. Customers don't mind talking to bots. They're fine with it. Um, they don't mind interacting with technology because again, they don't really want to talk to you. They just want to answer your question. But where companies sometimes fall down is if they use bots as deflection, but they don't allow you to communicate with a human being if you're not getting your answer. So <laughs> yes. That is the like number one failure of teams. It's like, it's, it's the, it's the equivalent of the IVR, you know, where you're calling in, that's your, those voice things. And like, they're tr exactly. never letting you talk to a human being. <laughs> the same thing applies like, in the car, human. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's happening with this technology though, that's really exciting. Like we just launched a flow builder that essentially allows you to be serving up self-serve content there in a really compelling way. You can create all sorts of trees and your customers can just really be feeling like they're actually getting everything they need and interacting with you and you're not actually even talking to them. So it's, it's, it's a big opportunity. I think, I think um, there's not just us, we're not the only ones to do it, but I, I, I do think it's a really, it's the future is here. And again, it's all merging across these channels. So that is gonna be everywhere. Totally. Like, I, I totally agree. And, and just even going back to something you said earlier, right? Helping your customers buy or use your product. If they're on their website and, you know, you have an ability to have them, you know, ask a question and get an answer. It doesn't matter if it's a human or, or if it's a bot, but also don't forget to, to test that out, like to actually have people go through it from time to time because you have that experience where it might take someone like 27 answers to get what they're looking for. So 
Um, Agreed. We are up on time, Jeff. This has been unbelievably insightful. We've gotten lots of messages from people just thanking you. So, you know, thanks for the insights. Um, it was great, everyone. Thanks so much for your questions and thank you Traction for hosting us today. Um, and if anyone has any other questions, I guess it's fair to say reach out on social media to either yep. you or myself and we'll be happy to answer anything from there. Excellent. It was great chatting with you, Julie, and thank you all for attending. Uh, feel free to reach out. I'm out there. <laughs> See you later. I need some traction.